Hi, this is Michael Buffer, and welcome to the Box Hard Podcast. Hello, everyone. This is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Kosmo. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 123 of the Box Hard Podcast. I'm your host, Joey Kosman. and I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how you doing? I'm good, Joey. Yourself? Very good, my friend. Very good. This, of course, episode 123, episode 123. We're going to dive straight into the review part of the show. Of course, there's lots of things to go over from last weekend. I'm going to start over on the... On the Friday, this card actually took place at the York Hall. Obviously, it was a Haymaker Ring Star card. It was good to see Richard Schaefer there in attendance. Obviously, I think that's the that's the second um, Haymaker Ring Star fight card, but he wasn't at the first one. It was good to see him there. Um, on this bill, we had um, Sam Gilly moved to 4-0. and It was a knockout win for him against Daniel Bazo. Daniel Bazo, you know, he was a guy coming in there with, with a, a losing record, but he did well. Sam Gilly really impressed me, showed the killer instinct. His corner was screaming at him to calm down when he had his man hurt. He wasn't listening to none of it. He, he just jumped straight in there. You know, he went a little bit wild, but we're going to, we're gonna you know, let him get away with that. He really showed his killer instinct there, really impressed me. Um, Mo Garib was also on the bill. He had quite a stern test in just his second outing, to be honest. We also got to see quite a bit of flashiness from him. I like what I see with Garib, he's also um, he also has a very very vocal fan base that was making a lot of noise there. It was just the first fight, and the noise was unbelievable for Mo Garib. He's now two and zero. Oh. Um, that was a points win there against Jamie Spate, a man that we all know pretty well. Um, also, Jack Newham, he fought on the bill. He took on Jan Korek, who was one and eight going in again. A bit of a showcase card, this one in its in its entirety. Um, Jack Newham moved to three and oh, it was a points win for him. He banked four important rounds where I think that you know he, he would have learned quite a bit in those four rounds. It was a good fight that one. Um, also, a fighter that I'm getting to like quite well now, a guy called Anesu Twala. He moved to four and oh, it was a four round points win against Reese Saunders. Um, you know, he, he battered his opponent. To be completely honest, he didn't really need to get out of first or second gear. Um, you know, his opponent had a really bloodied face and stuff like that. The scorecards was 40 to 37 in favor of Twala. Um, so, yeah, he goes the distance there. Four wins for him now, and all four have gone to points. But he actually hits harder than what you'd believe. Um, also on this bill, we saw a win from Dean Richardson. He moved to 6-0. and um, Linus Eudophia, he moved to 7-0, and a win against William Warburton, a points win there. Um, Willie Hutchinson, that was a great, great fight. He took on Eric Maconzo. Now, Maconzo certainly turned up, up for this one. He really, really was. Um, it was a wide points win in the end, because I think there were two knockdowns in favour, or maybe, I think it was two knockdowns in favour, of course, of Willie Hutchinson. But I tell you what, he certainly didn't have it all his own way. His first two pro fights, he's had knockouts in the second round. Well, this one went six rounds. Again, a points win, um, 60-52 to 52 there for Willie Hutchinson. Hutchinson, but he got caught quite a lot. There was a few really, really worrying moments. It made for a great fight, and to be honest, it was fight of the night in York Hall. As I said many, many times, in York Hall, any given night you go there, there's always an epic fight, and that one came closest to it. I mean, he won every round, but, you know, it was a good fight while it lasted. Um, also on this bill, we saw a guy called Jermaine Camaro. He was 6-1 and one going in. He took on Freddie Kiewit, who I didn't really know too much about. And Camaro was the uh, the Southern Area champion, but his belt wasn't on the line. He was a late replacement, to be completely honest. And he was very slick, very um, skillful boxer, but he seemed like he 
he didn't have the biggest punch on him. Um, yeah, he took on Freddie Kiwit. As I said, he actually lost on points. Freddie Kiwit managed to get a points win over eight rounds in his favour. Yeah, good stuff there for Freddie Kiwit. He showed me quite a lot, to be honest. I mean, he's a good-looking fighter. Um, you know, he's, he's he's got a pretty face. He's one of those guys where you think, can he really fight? And I think he showed us that he can really fight. You know, really good timing. He wasn't staying in the pocket and trading for too long, even though I think he probably could have got away with it, to be honest, against this guy here. It was very awkward. He was showing he was very hard to hit. And, you know, to do all of that against a guy who was a last-minute opponent change kind of thing, I think that was quite impressive from Freddie Kiwit. He's now 13-2. and two. And the main event on this one, of course, the Olympic silver medalist from Rio 2016, Joe Joyce. He moved to 2-0. and oh. It was a KO in the very first round against Rudolf Josic, who was 4-1 and one going in, now 4-2. and two. No great shakes, Rudolf Josic, but what I will say, I'm not quite sure that the home viewers know about this, but they made him stand up on the stage, on that beautiful stage. That little entrance thing that they had set up looked absolutely gorgeous, but he was standing there waiting for his music to come on for no joke about 10 minutes at least while they were showing all these promos and David Hay was being interviewed and I could imagine his legs were probably quite tired so I think he wanted to go down um, and have a little rest and I think he did that at the first opportunity to be honest um yeah I don't even think the punch landed properly it seemed like it kind of landed on the guy's shoulder but anyways, it was what it was. He wasn't going to beat Joe Joyce. He gets out again. He gets another win on his slate there, Joe Joyce. And like I say, I want to see him now take on somebody quite gritty. Um, you know, more like the kind of Ian Lewis and level, and perhaps beyond that, in his third fight, which is actually set to happen on the Hay Bell You undercard. Obviously, the press conference for that happened earlier this week. Moving over now to the Grand Sierra Resort and Casino. This one happened in Nevada, USA. This one was shown on Box Nation. Couple fights to mention on this bill, by the way. Um, heavyweight Brian Jennings. He moved to twenty-two and two. It was a TKO in round three for him. A good win there against. Akror Muralimov. Um, Muralimov was down twice in the first round, once in the second round, and twice in the third and final round. So, quite destructive performance there from Brian Jennings. I didn't see it though; it wasn't televised. Shakur Stevenson moved to five and zero. Oh. It was a points win over eight rounds against Juan Tapia, who was eight and one. Decent little win there for Shakur Stevenson. He looked good doing it. He really cruised to that eight round points win. Looked quite impressive as well. I mean, he does a lot of a lot of little things that are quite um not so eye-catching but smart stuff i really like his ring iq um also on this bill Egidus cavalascus again i think his name's i think they call him aegis i'm gonna just call him aegis anyway he moved to 19 and oh he defended successfully his nabf welterweight title against david avanessian the former world champion it was a tko in round six David Evanesian, really, really nice guy. The game plan, by the way, this is confirmed, was that they were going to really try and take off after about six rounds or something like that. But he seemed to get caught in that sixth round, and that was it. So the game plan was to start off slow. And to be honest, at the point of the stoppage, he was very much in that fight, Avanesian. But I'm quite liking the look of Aegis here, Kavalowskis. I really like the look of him. 19-0, and, and boy, oh boy, can he punch. Main event here. Raimundo Beltram finally picks up a world title. It was the vacant WBO world lightweight title before the bout. After the bout, it belonged to Raimundo Beltran. He slept with the belt. There's a lovely photo of him going around Twitter with it wrapped around his chest. And he's out cold in some kind of hotel bed. Anyway, he went to 35 wins with 7 losses and 1 draw. It was a unanimous decision win over 12 rounds against Paulus Moses, who was 40-3. and three. That fight itself, Raimundo Beltran started really well. Moses came on strong in like round three. He was cutting Beltran's face up, to be honest. He really went on to put some work in Moses. And Beltran was being tagged repeatedly, and it made the fight, you know, very close. But Beltran came on strong in that later part of the fight. I think that maybe the body shots played a part in Moses slowing down. He seemed to tire and, and slow down in the later part of the fight. And my gut feeling was that it was probably about 8-4 in favour of Beltran. But the right man definitely won the fight. And to be honest, the fight was much better than the scorecards would have would have said so. Because the scorecards were very, very wide, to be honest. And they didn't really tell the story of a good fight, which it certainly was for many of those rounds. And pretty much the whole fight. But yeah, credit to Raimundo Beltran. If anybody deserves to be a 
world champion. It's him. He's been, you know, served up some hard luck before. And once again, he was fighting for his green card. They need to just keep putting his green card on the line in every fight because he's more and more impressive the more times they put his green card on the line. It's a bizarre, bizarre situation. But all the very best to Raimundo Beltran now, 35-7 and seven with one draw. Moving over now to the arena in Ludwigsburg, in Baden-Württemberg, <laughs> Germany. I think I did quite work quite well there, to be honest. On this bill, one fight to mention, Vincent Feigenbutz, he moved to 28 wins. He's only got two losses. He uh, defended, I think he defended, I, think, I don't think the title was vacant. But anyway, the belt that was on the line was the IBF Intercontinental Super Middleweight title. It was a win here for Feigenbutz over Rhino Liebenberg, who was 18-5. and five. I've never heard of him, to be honest. It was a TKO in round six for Feigenbutz. Um, moving over now to Ireland, one fight over there, the cruiserweight now, Mike Perez, he picked up a TKO in round one, a really destructive comeback after bailing out of the World Boxing Super Series cruiserweight tournament, he's now 23-3 and with one draw. Um, moving over now to Manchester Arena in Lancashire, this one was certainly the big one of the weekend, um... On the undercard, Sebastian Eubank, I know he was going a little bit, um, well, he was having a little bit of a moan on Twitter because they wouldn't televise his fight because his brother, Chris Eubank Jr., was on the bill. Um, you know, I admire the WBSS, the World Boxing Super Series, for kind of standing by their, you know, their normal rules and not bending them for, for anybody, you know, so um, credit to them. But Sebastian Eubank managed to win his debut. He's now 1-0. and It was a points win over four rounds against a guy who was 2-8 and eight called Kamil Kaluksik. Um, Kaluksik was also down in the third round, so, you know, a points win there for Seb Eubank. Looking forward to see if he's any good. Um, Simon Valili, 12-1. and one. He actually ended up fighting Blaze Menduo, who's 4-8. and eight. Simon Valili, for whatever reason, I don't think um, his opponent... Uh, was able to fight his original opponent. I think the fight fell through at the last minute. So hard luck there for Simon Valili, but he picked up a TKO in the fourth and final round against Blaze Menduo. Um, who else was on this bill? Who else was on this bill? Zach Parker, a guy that I really, really like the look of. He absolutely obliterated Luke Blackledge, as we all know, in the first round. Well, he went to the second round this time against a guy called Adasat Rodriguez, who was 16-6 and six with two draws. Really destructive, Zach Parker. Boy, oh boy, he's only young, the guy. And, you know, they're, they're already saying that he's being quite heavily avoided by some of the top guys at that weight. You know, he, he's a 168 fighter. And like I say, he's young. And boy, oh boy, he's got such a bright future. He's with the Sowlands, as I've said a couple of times. Really think that they've... I really think that they've nicked one of our gems there. Um, also on this bill, Tommy Langford really, really, really impressed me against Jack Armfield. Tommy Langford, 19-1, and one, successfully defended his British middleweight title over 12 rounds against... Jack Armfield, it was a unanimous decision win for Tommy Langford. Tommy Langford fought really, really aggressively from the get-go. It really surprised me. I mean, both men in this fight, you know, they, they met in the center of the ring. It was quite a fast-paced fight, which I found quite surprising also. And Langford looked really good when he was trading. You know, many of the early rounds were really quite close and difficult to score. But as the fight went on, though, the champion, obviously Tommy Langford, he really pulled away. And this becomes... To be honest, probably his most significant win of his career this, you know, this far in my opinion, because Armfield's got quite a, you know, quite a few good wins on his resume, and you know he had some great momentum going into that one. But Langford ended up winning fairly comfortably at the, at the very end. Um, what I just want to say, I just want to quickly backtrack. Also, um, I'd really, really like to see Zach Parker take on Rocky Fielding, but I know that fight probably won't happen because Rocky Fielding vacated the British title last week, but. Um, Maybe Jamie Cox against Zach Parker. I think that would be a great, great fight. Um, moving up the bill once again, Ryan Walsh defending his British featherweight title against Isaac Lowe. Ryan Walsh 22-2 and with one draw. Isaac Lowe 14-0 and with two draws. It ended up being a split draw over 12 rounds. Now... This fight here, I think Isaac Lowe started really, really fast. He was bouncing around sometimes a little bit too much on his feet. He wasn't being hit, but as the fight went on, he seemed to slow down a bit. And like I say, when you're bouncing on your feet a lot, it really tires you out. You know, sometimes you don't really need to be doing that. Richie Woodall had 
had Isaac Lowe two rounds up with four rounds to go, and then he actually gave um, rounds 9, 10, and 11 to Walsh, meaning that Lowe could only get a draw if he won the final round. I think as the fight went on, Isaac Lowe was probably expected to tire. You know, he's also, not many people know this, but he's also got a full-time job. Um, Isaac Lowe, you know, it's amazing that he's able to be as good as what he is. Imagine if he was a full-time boxer, you know, he'd, he'd be unbelievable. The fight was a really hard fight to score, but I think the 12th round was a really, 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 really good round, and it really ended what had been a really good fight. I said really so many times there. But yeah, it was a draw, and one thing that is good that comes out of this in favour of Isaac Lowe is that he still remains undefeated. He's now 14 and 0 with three draws, but these draws are beginning to annoy him. I know that for sure. Tyson Fury, a good friend of his, he certainly thought he won the fight, but it was what it was. It was certainly a close, close fight, this one. Um, also, the main event here, of course, George Groves, 27 and 3, defending his WBA Super World Super Middleweight title in the other corner. Chris Eubank Jr., 26-1, and one, defending his IBO at World Super Middleweight title. Eubank was cut above the right eye when the heads clashed in the third round. It seemed to be a really, um, quite a bad cut, and I think that um, Chris Sanagar did really quite well with the cut in the corner. It continued to flow the blood, really, the whole fight, but I think Sanagar did really well with it, but... Boy, oh boy, what a fight, I as I'm going to let you start with it. It was a cracker of a fight. What, wow, what a crack of a fight it was. What can I say? Before the build-up of the fight, Eubank Jr. was going to Eubank Jr. was saying, oh, uh, sleep tight with your belt. You've only got a few days left. It's a middleweight moving up to super middleweight. George Groves was using that jab. George Groves hurt him a lot a few times. From the head class, Chris Eubank Jr. was busted up from the whole fight. George Groves boxed with an excellent game plan. A lot a lot of people, boxing uh, people, they, they were saying, how, many, how, how, how much has he got left in the tank? And to be honest, he's proved a lot of people wrong. They said that after the two Carl Frotch fight and the bad, after the two Carl Frotch loss and the Badu Jock loss, you can see this uh, partnership with him and Shane McGugan. It's what can I say? It's very good. And obviously, Groves was winning the fight. I think personally, when Eubank Jr. Uh, fell to the ground, I think uh, George Groves dropped him. Chris Eubank Jr. in the last three rounds. That's when he hit, tried to go for the pedal, uh, hit the gas. But in the 12th round, you can see when you saw George Groves' uh, uh, shoulder pop out, and even Eubank Jr. still couldn't go for it. Yeah. And George Gregg is still hitting him. Well, what can I say? Well, well done, George Gregg. He's into the final. And I think, personally, I think he's going to win the, I think he's going to win the tournament. And I think he beats Callum Smith if Callum Smith wins. Yeah, I mean, it was a really, really good fight. Um, I actually had... Uh, the first two rounds to George Groves. I think he started really well. And then after that, I actually gave the third and fourth to Chris Eubank Jr. So I actually had it level after four. And then I actually gave the fifth a 10-10. So I had it level after five. Um, that is where I really saw Groves pull away. So going into that sixth round and the sixth, seventh, eighth, all the rest of those rounds there, I was expecting Eubank to kind of pull away in the second half of the fight and I don't mean that he would win the fight I just mean that I thought he'd probably be the fresher guy I thought he'd probably win a few rounds but he seemed to be the complete opposite to that Groves seemed to get better as the fight went on in my opinion maybe you know maybe he was a little bit nervous what I do want to say though is Groves when he comes out walking to the ring and he comes out to that prodigy tune he really gets my blood flowing really gets my blood pumping and just gives me goosebumps because he comes marching into, he comes surging into that ring, absolutely, almost like sprinting into that ring to that crazy music and the the bashing of of different instruments. And I love that when he did that. I, w- I almost did a cartwheel in my living room. It was unbelievable. He just got me so excited when he got in the ring. Like I say, maybe the nerves got to him a little bit early. I don't think that the nerves got to Eubank Junior. A lot of people were saying that. I think that the occasion didn't really get to him. I just think that's what he is um so yeah going into the sixth round i gave i gave groves the sixth round the seventh round i i I was being quite lenient with eubank i gave it a 10 10 and then i literally gave groves the eighth ninth tenth and eleventh and that was where eubank really did need a knockout and then in the twelfth round obviously as you mentioned also i as george groves dislocated his shoulder in that twelfth round as we think it was a dislocated shoulder there's been no proper clarification, but 
In the second half of that 12th round, George Groves could not move his left arm at all. As you said there, obviously, he dislocated his shoulder. He could not move his left arm at all. And he only had his right to throw back with and defend with. And Chris Eubank Jr., maybe he smelt a bit of blood, I don't know, but he went for the kill. And I've had some people coming at me on Twitter saying that I'm delusional and stuff like that. But there was a point in that 12th round where Shane McGuigan was screaming at at George Groves to hold or whatever, something like that. And he wasn't doing it because obviously, you know, he only had one arm. And Chris Eubank Jr. was absolutely swarming him. He was all over him. And George Groves was not firing back. And I was getting quite worried because I thought that one or two landed punches or one or two of those crazy eye-catching flurry of punches that Eubank's famous for, if he does this, I think that the referee could have had a chance to stop the fight I'm not saying it would have been the right call I'm just saying that there was a little moment in there I'm not saying that Eubank was in the fight Eubank needed a knockout he got beaten quite comprehensively but what I will say is there was a few seconds where I was extremely worried in that 12th round that Eubank was going to get a stoppage Not because he was going to knock Groves out and knock him unconscious, but there was a moment where he was jumping all over him. Groves was not firing back. He was not reacting. He was on the ropes, and he was being punched on the ropes quite a lot. Whether the shots were landing clean or not, it looked to be a worrying few seconds there for for George Groves. And if there was, you know, another 30 seconds in the round, we could be saying all sorts of different things. And I know that woulda, coulda, shoulda doesn't really come into it, but there was a moment there that is all I would say there was a moment there some people think I'm crazy and you know what there's a lot of people that have come out the woodwork now and it's like they hate Eubank so bad that they're making out that Groves won a shutout decision Groves fought excellently well okay and I wanted Groves to win and I as predicted Groves would win and you know I wanted him to win but it wasn't like a complete shutout. There was, I mean, I had it at the end of, of it all. I had it Groves with 117 and Eubank 113. So 117 to 113. So there was four points in it for me. Groves should have perhaps had one or two knockdowns, but they weren't called. And like I said, there was a few close rounds. And it seems like all of those close rounds, everybody just wants to give to Groves because of all the hate for Eubank. It was a closer fight than I believe a lot of the Twitter fans had it. Um, the judges probably had it, I think one or two of them had it way too close, but for me, I had I had Groves by four points, and I think Barry McGuigan said he had Groves by four points as well, so my scorecard was quite accurate, but some people weren't liking what I had to say on Twitter, but it is what it is, I love these fights that everybody gets, you know, gets, it, gets right into, and has their, you know, has their arguments with, for and against, it is what it is, you know, that is boxing, it's a, it's a fantastically entertaining and enthralling sport at times and this was one of the fights that brings out the best of it um but yeah in the end you know quite a dominant points win for George Groves I predicted incorrectly here I thought Eubank would get the stoppage UIs went with George Groves to win on points you got that one right and also on the undercard I should have said um I predicted Isaac Lowe to win on points so did UIs and the listeners had Walsh to win on points obviously that contest was a draw so um, no points for that one, and uh, the listeners also went with Groves to win on points, so two points up so far for the listeners, um, well, one point up for for you, and one point for the listeners, two points together, of course, so I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely hating the Prediction League at the moment, because all five contests that I predicted last week, all five of them, I was very, well, not all of them, but most of them I was very confident for, and I've not got a single one right, so again, Yourself, eyes, and the listeners really, really running away with it now. Moving over now to the Mandalay Bay Hotel and Casino over in Las Vegas, Nevada. Um, a couple of fights to mention on this bill, especially. Edwin Rodriguez moved to win number 30. He's got two losses also. It was a unanimous decision win over 10 rounds against Lionel Thompson. Your Dennis Ugas, he moved to 21 and 3. It was a TKO in round 7 against Ray Robinson, who was 24 and 2, now 24 and 3. Robinson was down in the very first round and also in the seventh and final round, and he was also deducted a point at the end of round 4 for hitting Ugas after the bell. Um, 
Moving up this bill once again, I managed to stream this fight. I managed to get my stream right just for this fight here, um, and you know, and, and the main event. But this one here, David Benavidez, 19 and 0, defending his WBC World Super Middleweight title against Ronald Gavril. Ronald Gavril, 18 and 2, now 18 and 3, and Benavidez is now 20 and 0. It was, of course, a rematch. The first fight was a pretty good one. Obviously, the only real event that was kind of, you know, of note in the first one was that Benavidez got knocked down in the final round. Well, here, Benavidez looked absolutely brilliant in the second part of the fight. He certainly, certainly didn't tire at all. Um, but what I will say is Ronald Gavril is a tough, tough, tough guy. I think he gives anybody problems, really, at the super middleweight division. Um, Benavidez was just extremely dominant. It was a shutout on my card for him. Um, he, he pretty much won everything. There was a little moment in there where... Uh, you know, his corner, the corner of Ronald Gavril looked like they were going to try and pull him out at one point. The referee asked, you know, asked Gavril to show him something. To be honest, he didn't really show him much. There was one round where he fought. He, he probably could have got a 10-10 round, to be honest. It's not like he won the round, but, you know, he, he's got a lot of heart, Ronald Gavril. He really has. And, you know, he's the only man to have gone 24 rounds now with Benavidez without being knocked down, let alone knocked out. So, um... Credit to Ronald Gavril, but I'm very, very pleased for my man David Benavidez. I sent him a text, uh, you know, just congratulating him on his win, and he actually got back to me about 20 minutes after the fight. He probably still had his gloves on when he sent the text back to me. Really, really humble, nice young kid there. He is the youngest ever super middleweight world champion in the history of the sport. Unbelievable stuff. The main event on this one, again, a fight that I watched. Danny Garcia took on Brandon Rios. Danny Garcia now 34 and 1. Brandon Rios 34. 34 and 4 with one draw. It seemed to be quite a good fight. Obviously, we all know that Brandon Rios is back with Robert Garcia, and Brandon Rios showed up in great shape. Um, he gave he gave Garcia lots of problems. He was getting off with his combinations, which I think was quite surprising. Garcia, obviously, you know, he's a much, 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 much fresher fighter. Um, you know, he's, he's more so in his prime than Rios is. Nobody really gave Rios a chance. However, I said that Rios would probably lose on points, so I said Danny Garcia would win the fight on a decision. Um, I, as you, went with Garcia to win on points also, and our listeners went with Garcia to win by knockout, and this is where they got the victory because... Brandon Rios was knocked out in the ninth round. It was a fight where, like I say, there was a lot of back and forth. It was quite a close kind of fight. I'd say that, you know, Garcia was definitely ahead. Again, some of the Garcia haters are, are really taking to Twitter saying that Rios was giving him a proper beat. And I don't think that was the case. I think that, you know, after eight rounds, we're not going to score the ninth because that's when the knockout come. But I think it was probably something like six to two in terms of the round. So it wasn't like he was getting a boxing lesson from Rios. But... You know, it was a good fight. Rios came to fight, and you know, based on that, I'm I'm not quite sure. I mean, if he can stay in that kind of shape, maybe there's one or two other big fights out there. But I mean, I didn't really give him a chance against Danny Garcia, to be honest. I think Danny Garcia had too much for him and was too fresh for him going into that fight. But well done to Garcia for getting the knockout. Obviously, um, it looked a beautiful, beautiful shot. Brandon Rios, you know, he he, he got hit, and like I say, he jumped up again. He's got a lot of heart, that boy. Nobody's ever thrown that into question and um, the referee decided to stop it I think Rios probably could have carried on but you know on paper that's a great great that looks really good to stop Rios there something that Manny Pacquiao couldn't do so um, credit to Danny Garcia on that one moving over now to the Don Haskins Convention Center in El Paso Texas one or two fights to mention on this bill also Former world champion Austin Trout, he moved to 31-4 and four inside 35 fights. It was a unanimous decision win against Juan D. Angel. He was 20-7, and seven, now 20-8 and eight with one draw. Tony Harrison was on the bill. He moved to 26-2, and two, a TKO in round five against George Sosa, uh, who's now 15-12 and 12 with one draw. No great fighter, to be honest, him. And a huge upset on this bill. Friend of the show, he was on last week. Thomas Williams Jr., 20 and 3 going in. He's now 20 and 4. He was knocked out in the fourth round. If I'm not mistaken, I think he was also down in round two once or twice. And he got knocked out by Humberto Velasco Torres, who nobody, to be honest, has heard of. I think he'd only beaten five fighters with winning records going into that fight. And he took on Thomas Williams Jr., who, you know, he's a good fighter. He's a guy that obviously was coming off of two losses 
to Marcus Brown and Adonis Stevenson. But those fighters are, you know, they're great, great fighters. Potential um, world-level fighter in, in Marcus Brown and obviously a world champion in Adonis Stevenson. So there was no real shame in losing the two fights. But losing to this guy here, who nobody knows, is... You know, this is awful. So I'm not quite sure where Thomas Williams Jr. goes from here. Um, You know, he's just been served up nothing but bad luck. I said to him last week, how important is it that 2018 is your year? He said very, very important. And, you know, he's been knocked out now three times in a row. And in that time, obviously, his, his role model and stepfather was killed in a tragic car accident. Um, you know, it's it's just an awful, awful, awful time for Thomas Williams Jr. He's a lovely, lovely fella, but you know, I, I don't know. He's he's really got to rethink here because that that is the kind of loss that you can't come back from, to be honest. So, um, yeah, I really feel for him. Um, Humberto Velasco Torres now nineteen and one with one draw. Also on this bill, Jennifer Han moved to seventeen and three with one draw. It was an IBF World Female Featherweight Title Contest, a unanimous decision for Jennifer Han over Lisbeth Crespo, who's now twelve and four. Ten two-minute rounds there in favour of Jennifer Han, a unanimous decision. Also on the bill, Caleb Plant moved to seventeen and zero. It was a unanimous decision over Rogelio Porky Medina. Medina's proved one or two times that he's a tough, tough guy. Even if he's overmatched, he will still take you to distance. Um, His record now 38 and 9. And the main event in this one, Devin Alexander, 27 and 4, took on Victor Ortiz, 32 and 6, with two draws. Again, we predicted on this one, Ayaz, you actually went with Alexander to win by knockout. I went with Alexander on points. So did the listeners. Well, it was another draw to mess up our predictions here. Um, it was a majority draw this one so two judges went with a draw the other judge went with Victor Ortiz which I found absolutely criminal to be honest Victor Ortiz certainly certainly didn't win that fight Um, Devin Alexander boxed a pretty good fight to be honest I think it was probably something like maybe 8-4 maybe 7-5 but certainly you could no way say that it was those scores in the favour of Victor Ortiz no way he was chasing the fight from the first bell to be honest and um You know, I mean, he came forward a lot, but I I don't think that you could... I I just don't understand how you could say that the fight was close or that that you could ever say that the fight went to a Victor Ortiz. I think that was terrible. And, you know, it was looking like they were they were talking about Devin Alexander, if he won, perhaps taking on Errol Spence. I think that fight probably won't happen now. Um, but, yeah, all the very best to Devin Alexander. A big shame for him. Now 27-4 and four with one draw. Victor Ortiz, 32-6 and six with three draws. Um... I think that is it. Yeah, that's it for the reviewing. So we've gone over that as quick as possible. Sorry if it dragged on a little bit. Again, we like to visit all the venues around the globe. That is it for the reviewing. The last thing to do before we wrap up part one is to welcome our very first guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the undefeated former WBC lightweight champion of the world, Mr. Omar Figueroa. Omar, welcome to the show. How's it going, man? Thank you for having me. It's all my pleasure, my friend. It's all my pleasure. So, Omar, we last spoke on the week of your last fight against Robert Guerrero. You'd obviously been out of the ring for over 18 months, and you got back in the ring at welterweight against Robert Guerrero, who, despite being past his best, he definitely comes to fight and can turn fights into real wars. However, you absolutely demolished him and became the first man to ever stop him. You knocked him out in the third round. I've never seen you fight so aggressively as that fight also. Tell us, Omar... How did you assess your performance, and what did you make of that win, by the way? Well, obviously, I was satisfied with the way I performed. Uh, I didn't really have, you know, time to really fully be able to assess what I could have done or uh, how the fight could have, you know, progressed or anything. So it's really hard to to assess my performance based off of, you know, basically one round because the first round I took it off, I was just testing and see what what he had and the second round is really when I when I started my fight and well obviously it should have ended in the second round but the ref let it continue and the third round was just more of the same 
And by the time your next fight rolls around, it would have been six, oh sorry, not six, nine months since the Guerrero win. Obviously, your upcoming fights against Adrian Broner at 140. You haven't weighed inside the 140 limit since the Daniel Estrada fight back in August 2014. So my first question on this fight, Omar, is who benefits more from the fact that the fight's at 140, yourself or Broner in your eyes? I do. Why is that? Because I feel like I'm the bigger man. And I should have no problem making 140 uh, when the time comes. The main thing is for, for me to be healthy. And uh, that's one thing that we're, we're, working, we're working really hard on to achieve. And if, if I am healthy, then I shouldn't have any problems with the weight nor the fight. And you yourself, of course, were a world champion at lightweight. Adrian Broner was a world champion at super feather, lightweight, super lightweight, welterweight. But most boxing fans believe yourself and Broner are not really at your best at, you know, at welterweight. People believe that you're both better off at perhaps lightweight or even 140 maximum. Do you agree with that or do you think it doesn't really matter? It doesn't matter. Anything else to add on that? No, sir. And also, Omar... What are your thoughts on Broner as a fighter? I know, I know myself that you've you've wanted to fight him for a couple of years now. I remember the first time we ever spoke, you said that that's the guy you want, and it seemed to be quite a way away from happening. It's now, it's now happening. It's now finally here. But yeah, how would you sum up Broner as a fighter, and how excited are you to finally get him in the ring with you? Well, I feel Broner is a great fighter. I mean, I feel like even though he lost his way a little bit, he got caught up in in what boxing, you know, brought to him. Um, I feel that if he really focuses, he can be, you know, the fighter that he used to be, at least when he was on top. Um, he's lost to elite opposition. So I feel that I, I'm not taking him lightly, first off. First and foremost, I'm not taking him lightly at all. I know what he's capable of. We've seen it. We've seen him at his best. We've seen him at his worst. And even after the beating he was taking with Maidana, he, he still put up a good fight and had Maidana hurt at the end and, could have even, you know, finished him off had he, you know, tried harder or been more in shape or maybe not have suffered as much as he suffered in the first few rounds. But uh, we, we're preparing for a great fight. We know it's going to be a good one, and uh, the fans will thoroughly enjoy this one for sure. And obviously, in Broner's last fight, he lost to Mikey Garcia. I remember speaking to Mikey Garcia on this show um, after that fight, and one thing he did tell me was that Broner can certainly punch. However, you've actually got a slightly higher knockout percentage than Adrian Broner. Do you believe that this fight, uh, you know, we may see a stoppage from either of you, or do you think it goes the distance? If I had to say so, I think it's probably a distance fight. I know, I'm definitely stopping him. Oh, okay. I like that. I like that. Obviously, the fight's set for April 21st on Showtime. However, there hasn't yet been a, ve- a venue confirmed for it. Do you know what cities are in the running to host the event, or are you totally unsure at this stage? I have no idea, and it really doesn't matter. The ring is the same size no matter where we fight. Yeah, no, fair enough, fair enough. And also, I I hate to bring attention to negativity, but I know for sure Adrian Broner, um, obviously he's been involved in a few things outside the ring recently um, for all kinds of of rumors that I've heard, all all sorts of unsavory uh, reasons. Something happened with him in a shopping mall, but I also heard that you'd perhaps been in some kind of trouble with the law. Is there any truth in that at all, Omar? And also, what was your reaction when you heard, you know, that, that Adrian Broner had been arrested for what we've been told it was for? Oh, I mean, yeah, that's definitely true. You know, I'm not here to to hide what what I've done. I mean, it's out it's out in the media anyway. Um, you know, I'm only human. We all make mistakes, I guess. And uh, but yeah, no, I mean, some Browner doing something like that is obviously no surprise to anybody. Um, I just hope he's able to get you know get it together for the fight, and uh, you know that we're both 100 percent, and that you know we give the fans what they deserve, which is obviously a good fight a good show yeah we certainly hope so and also i just wanted to get your opinion on a couple of other fights i remember when we last spoke i think it was the last time we spoke we were talking about um the upcoming canelo and triple g fight i remember you saying to me that you hoped it lived up to our very high expectations it seemed to do so it was a really good fight but unfortunately uh you know one or two strange scorecards made it a little bit negative obviously the rematch is coming around second time round a lot of people now are kind of favoring canelo to win whereas before everybody was was well not everybody but most people were going with golovkin i think you said golovkin as well how do you see the rematch playing out omar 
I honestly didn't even watch the first one, so I, I can't <laughs> say. I don't know how no. it went. Um, I just hope it's another good fight. Last question for you now, Omar. I just wanted to ask you, you kind of said it yourself, really. You said that you can see yourself stopping Adrian Broner. Can you narrow that down at all? Have you got any kind of prediction which part of the fight you can see the stoppage coming? I don't think he'll make it past uh, six. So you reckon a knockout before six? Yeah. Okay, dokie. And just before I let you go, Omar, if you've got any kind of uh, message to send your UK fans, please just take it away. Say whatever you like. Oh, of course. Always, you know, thank you for the support. I appreciate it. I hope one day I get to fight over there. Um, that would be that would be awesome. I would I've always wanted to fight overseas. And, you know, hopefully they get to see me live someday as well. Um other than that is just um uh, thank you for your support. Yeah, and like I say, Omar, you know, we, we really appreciate a good fighter and you certainly are one. But listen, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, my friend. You know that. Thank you for your time. Best of luck for April 21st and we'll catch up sometime after your victory. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, now it's time for part two on this week's show. This part, of course, the news part. Let's go over to Ayers with the latest news. Ayers, take it away. Andy Lee has retired from boxing. Yeah, obviously Andy Lee was, you know, a former world champion himself, um, you know, a great fighter really up until the end. Um, it was good that he didn't carry on too long. Hopefully this is a proper retirement. I don't really like to see people retire and then come back. But, you know, he kind of seemed to go out of the game at the right time. He didn't go on too long and lose fights that he wouldn't have lost in his prime kind of thing. And right up until the end, even the back end of his career kind of thing, he still had that huge one-punch finisher that he showed us many, many times. I mean, that fight in particular against John Jackson, where he was getting beat and he just found that absolute punch from the gods to completely knock him unconscious was unbelievable and you know he did it time and time again obviously I remember when he knocked Peter Quillian down um, I can't remember who else he fought recently around that same kind of time and he completely beat them as well um, but yeah, you know, he, he showed us many, many fights over the years, a fantastic relationship he had and, and continues to have with the um, Stewart family, that of course, the wife of Emmanuel Stewart, he's kept in contact with them and he's one of boxing's good guys, Andy Lee, from what I'm told, I've never actually been fortunate enough to meet him, but um, all the very best to him, he's, he's a great, great guy from what I've heard and like I say, he's, he's an Irish fighter with, with a huge punch and we've got many, many of those, we've seen many over the years and um you know he was a cut above the rest to be honest Jürgen Bremer has pulled out the fight against Callum Smith and therefore Nike Holskin will step in and fight Callum Smith yeah, I mean, the the bizarre thing about this is that it's actually going to still go ahead as a pay-per-view. I think it's £9.95, something like that. Um, I think it's absolutely terrible. Um, it's not Callum Smith's fault. That's what people have to forget. People are tagging all the Smith brothers in and giving them abuse and stuff like that. The last person's fault it is is Callum Smith. I mean, Callum Smith, as I said, he's only fought one Southpaw in his whole career. He was going to be taking on Jürgen Bremer. The one Southpaw he fought was a guy who had a record of something like 15 and 3 with two draws and um, you know that guy took Callum Smith the distance and obviously Callum Smith's a bit of a knockout artist so I don't know if he gets on great with Southpaws and Jürgen Bremer's a world level Southpaw so you know the, I, I actually found that fight quite quite a hard fight and of course Callum Smith would have been preparing for a southpaw the whole of camp and now I think it was on Tuesday I think the fight fell through so with four days to go Bang, he's in there with an orthodox fighter and a guy that apparently was a really, really good kickboxer or something like that. I don't know too much about him as a pro. Um, I'm not going to check out his resume because I did it the other day and there wasn't any names on there that stood out to me. But like I say, it's completely... Um, you know, it's it's great that the World Boxing Super Series have got the reserves that can just jump in with a few days' notice. But the bad thing is that, you know, the fans don't like to see that. So... Could it have been postponed? Possibly, you know, because we're not quite sure what's happening with George Groves. Maybe they could have postponed this one, and then in that time, George Groves could have healed up and then got ready for the winner, because hopefully we don't see George Groves be pulled out of the final. Otherwise, the fans will go ballistic, because Callum Smith's going to beat this guy on Saturday, and then he could be fighting in the final somebody who, again, we've never heard of. So... Yeah, it's a shame for Callum Smith. He beat Eric Skoglund in the quarterfinals. Now in the semifinals, 
through no fault of his own. He's now taking on this guy here. And I was going to do the prediction league for the Bremer and Smith fight, but I think everybody is thinking that Callum Smith's going to knock this guy out. So, um, yeah, I mean, we're not going to do the prediction league. And, uh, you know, the fight's still going ahead, but the most crazy thing ever is that the actual the actual card is now happening. Again, it's going to be happening in Germany. This, this guy he's taking on is not even German. Obviously, it was going to be in Jürgen Bremer's backyard. Callum Smith is not German, obviously. So, the card's in the wrong place at the moment. And, from what I've seen, they haven't even confirmed the undercard yet. So, it's all gone completely wrong for them. But, um, the show still goes ahead. So, I suppose a bit of credit on one on one hand. And, you know, a bit of, a bit of um, disappointment on the other, I suppose. But, yeah. Like I say, it's not Callum Smith's fault. We want him to win, and I'm sure he will win, and we will see him and George Groves in the final if they allow George Groves to actually compete in the final, because if they don't, it would be a great, great, great shame, because there won't be no belt on the line, will there, in the final? So, uh, yeah, we need to wait for George Groves, and, oh, it's just all gone wrong. But, you know, I'm, I'm happy to see Callum Smith in a fight anyway, of any magnitude. So, yeah, I'm happy about that, but that's about it. Um, any any more news for us, Ayers, at all? Match and Boxing have announced a card called Straight Out Brooklyn where it will be headlined by Danny Jacobs versus Masia Soleki, K.E. Taylor versus Bustos and Jaro Miller versus Johan Duapas. Yes, that card, of course, to take place on the 28th of April. Um, Danny Jacobs in against a guy from Poland called Maciel Sulecki, who's 26-0. and 0. Quite a good fighter, by the way. He's only 28. Um, he's, he's not a big puncher, 10 knockouts. But, yeah, this guy is quite a good fighter, so I'm quite looking forward to that one. I don't think it's a given, that fight at all. Um, you know, Katie Taylor's on the undercard. It's good for her to go out in the States and get a win, like I suppose she's going to probably get. And the heavyweight fight on the undercard, Big Baby Miller against Johan Duapas. That's quite a good fight, obviously. Duapas has been an opponent, you know, most of his big fights of his career. But, you know, he, he always shows up. He's quite a tough fighter, so that should be quite good. Um... Yeah, I mean, we, we'll obviously talk more in depth about this card when it happens, when it's closer to the time, obviously. It's an Eddie Hearn, Matram USA bill. And, um, yeah, you know, I'm looking forward to it. It should be quite good. It's a couple of days after my birthday. So, um, yeah, hopefully it's a good one. Is that it for the news, Ayaz? Yeah, that's it for the news. Okay, thank you very much, Ayaz. Moving over now to the preview part of the show. We're going to start with a card that's happening later tonight over in the United States at the Fantasy Springs Casino in Indio, California, USA. couple of fights to mention on this bill. Hector Tanahara returns. He's back in action here. Um, Manny Robles Jr., that's the son of the trainer Manny Robles. Manny Robles is a guy that trains quite a few guys, Michael Conlon being one of them. Um, he's 14 and 0, by the way. He's in an eight rounder against a guy who's 24 and 11. The top of the bill, though, for the WBO NABO featherweight title, Joseph Diaz, 25 and 0, takes on Victor Terrazas, who's 38 and 4 with two draws. That should be quite a good fight. Another step up for Joseph Diaz. I like what they're doing with him, but I do want to see him in with some of the guys that will give him problems, perhaps. Some of the bigger names in the featherweight division. I'd like to see maybe him in with Kid Galahad. I quite Quite like that fight. I know that Barry Awad would go for that for sure. Moving over now to Germany, the fight that we mentioned there, Callum Smith, 23-0, and takes on Nicky Holzken. I think that's how he said he's 13-0 and with 10 knockouts. He's 34 years of age. Um, the fight's happening a week before his birthday. I mean, that can be a, a silly fact, and that can be quite a good fact. So, uh yeah, hopefully he's not going to be partying for that one because we don't need that at all. He's coming off of a win against Viktor Polyakov, who's, you know, he, he's an okay fighter, I suppose. He's been quite toughly matched. But, yeah, he beat him. Um, he knocked him out in the second round. So I suppose that's quite impressive, to be honest, because Polyakov's only been knocked out the once, despite losing to a couple of prospects. Not great fighters, really. And also, um, again, we're really kind of interlocking here, but Polyakov got a win over Giovanni De Carolis. So, um, you know, it kind of shows you his level. But, yeah, it was a good win over him last time out. But aside from that win there, I don't really recognize any of the names on Holzkin's resume. But he's well up for the fight, I'm guessing. Um, I don't I don't know much about him at all. I'm, I'm kind of clutching at straws here. He's Dutch. He's from the Netherlands. And, um, you know, I hope he loses, to be honest, to Callum Smith. Um, there's no undercard fights for that one published yet. So it's a bit of a shame there. 
Moving over now to the York Hall in Bethnal Green in London. This bill happening on Saturday. It's the Frank Warren bill. A couple fights to mention on this bill. This one was added quite late on. Nathan Gorman's on the bill. His record 11 and 0. His opponent yet to be announced. Also on the bill, Hamza Shiraz in his second pro outing. It's a four rounder, but his opponent's yet to be announced. Harvey Horn gets out in his second pro contest. Um, he takes on Patrick Bartos. Umar Sadiq, 1-0, takes on my favourite tough journeyman, Adam Jones, 7-29 and with six draws. That's a four-rounder there. That's a risky, risky fight, by the way. Um, Ryan Garner's on this bill. He's looking to move to 7-0. and He's in a four-rounder against Lesfa Cantilano. Uh, Boy Jones Jr., 14-1 and with one draw, takes on Ronaldo Mora. 7-31 and 31 with one draw. If I'm not mistaken, I think that guy may have took on Zelfa Barrett. I'm not quite sure. Um, Archie Sharp, good friend of mine. He's on the bill, 11-0. and 0. His opponent yet to be announced. He's in an eight-rounder. I'd like to see him do the rounds here. Um, a really impressive fighter, by the way, Archie Sharp. I'm hoping that they show his fight on TV because boy, oh boy, can he fight. Super talented. Um, also on this bill, Daniel Dubois in his seventh pro contest. He fights for the Southern Area heavyweight title against the undefeated D.L. Jones, who is 8-0 with one draw. Um, I think D.L. Jones, even though he's 8-0, and I don't think he's knocked anybody out. And, you know, he's obviously he's obviously a heavyweight, so I don't think he's the most powerful puncher. Whereas it's the complete opposite with Daniel Dubois. Boy, oh boy, can he hit. I'm expecting another early knockout for him. Also on the bill, Zelfa Barrett, 19-0, and fights for the vacant IBF East and West Europe super featherweight title against Ronnie Clark, 20-4 and with two draws. Ronnie Clark's a Scottish fighter. I remember he gave... Um, Martin J. Ward quite a good fight at the Wembley Arena, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was back in November of 2016. Um, I'm not checking that, by the way. I'm gonna I'm gonna check it in a second to make sure I've got that right. But I think, if my memory serves me right, that is where they box. But yeah, Ronnie Clark definitely took on Martin J. Ward. I think he even put Martin J. Ward down as well, so he can fight. And I remember when they when they read the decision, all these Scottish fans were throwing beer cups into the ring. Um, so, yeah, all the very best to Zelfa Barrett. I mean, this is a first, for, for me anyway, this is his first kind of opponent that I really know quite well. So I'm looking forward to see how he gets on, really, because everybody's saying he's the goods and we're going to see here. I think he's kind of, he's got a bit of a padded record now, Zelfa Barrett. It seems a shame to say so, but he's going to be 20-0, and 0, hopefully, if he wins this. And, you know, on his, you know, on his resume so far, there's only one name that I recognise. And the main event here, Anthony Yard, 14-0, defending his WBO European light heavyweight title and his WBO intercontinental light heavyweight title against Tony Avalanche, who's 26-9 and with two draws. Um, Tony Avalanche, a guy that, I mean, again... It's, it's a kind of opponent that is on that same kind of level, I suppose, as some of his past opponents, Anthony Yard. He hasn't really got the name Tony Avalanche, and of his nine losses, he's only been knocked out twice. Um, he's 33, he's from France. I mean, he went the distance with 22-0 and Dominic Bozell. Dominic Bozell was a prospect, but he was quite a good fighter. Um, Bozell won that fight, but yeah, he went the distance with him. Um, looking at his resume here, Tony Avalanche, like I say, he got knocked out by Jürgen Bremer in the second round by a body shot. That was back in 2013. Um, he's had a couple of um, you know, losses on a split decision. He lost to Edward Gutnetch. That's the guy that George Groves put in a coma. He actually lost a split decision to him. Um... And the other time he got knocked out was back in 2007. So he's only been knocked out once in the last 10 years. And I suppose on paper that sounds quite good. He also lost a points decision to Christopher Rebras, who we all know very well. So he's mixed it at a decent-ish level. He hasn't really won at that level, to be honest. And um, I don't expect him to win here. I think Yard gets another explosive-looking knockout. I'd like to see Anthony Yard stepped up a little bit as well. But moving over now to the Doncaster Dome in Doncaster, Yorkshire, United. Kingdom. Couple fights to mention on this one. Dex Spellman, 11 and 0, takes on Scott Westgarth. That should be a decent fight. Dex Spellman's a guy that's, of course, a light heavyweight on the domestic scene. A lot of people saying he's quite good. He's up there in some people's minds with 
you know, Anthony Yard, Frank Buglioni, Jose Burton, those types of guys. Um, also on this bill, Andy Townend, 20-4. and four. He's got a big fight in a couple of weeks. Can't remember who it's against now, but he takes on William Warburton, another one of my favourite journeymen. That's an eight-rounder there. And the interesting fight on this bill, former footballer turned boxer Curtis Woodhouse, 24-7, and seven, takes on John Wayne Hibbert, 18-5. and five. That should be a really good fight. I'm actually backing Hibbert to get the win there. That one, of course, is a Steffi Ball Promotions card. Moving over now to the Forum in Inglewood, California, USA. Couple fights to mention. Who is on this bill? Who's on this bill? A few title fights. We've got Brian Villoria, 38 and 5, fighting for the vacant WBA World Flyweight title against Artem Delakian. I don't know too much about him, to be honest, but for the IBF World Flyweight title, Donny Nietes defending the belt, 40 and 1 with four draws. He takes on Juan Carlos Reveco, 30. 39 and 3. That should be a good bang up there. And Wisaxil Wangek, also known as Saw Rungvisai. He puts his WBC World Super Flyweight title on the line, the belt that he ripped away from Chocolatito Roman Gonzalez. His record, by the way, 44 and 4 with one draw. He takes on Juan Francisco Estrada, 36 and 2. We were hoping that Kao Fire would be on this bill, but unfortunately. He didn't fancy it. Um, I'm not saying that's because he's he's worried or scared of fighting anybody, but I don't think the numbers were right for him. But it would have been good to see him on this bill. Um, yeah, a few fantastic fights on that bill. I can't wait to see Rung Vasai in there once again. I'm backing him to get the win. He's one of my favourite fighters now, especially in the Asian region. Also, moving over now to the final bill to mention. This one happening this Sunday, which is Sunday the 25th of February. It's happening at the Victoria Warehouse Hotel in Manchester, Lancashire, United Kingdom. It's an Eddie Hearn show. It's going to be on Sky. Um, it's not a fantastic bill. It's a little bit average, this one, but a few names on it. Let's mention them here. Marcus Morrison, 15 and 2. He's in a uh, fight here. It doesn't say how many rounds, but it's to be announced, his opponent. Jose Burton gets out once again. His record, 20 and 1. His opponent yet to be announced. Natasha Jonas is in um, a fight here. She's 4 and 0. Oh. Her opponent's yet to be announced, but I think it's going to be. Um, I think, however many rounds it is, I think it's going to be three-minute rounds, so shout out to Natasha Jonas. Kess Ashfak makes his debut here in a four-rounder, his opponent yet to be announced. Jordan Gill, 18-0, and 0, takes on Jason Cunningham. Jason Cunningham, we were talking about him a couple weeks ago, he's the guy that fought Reese Bellotti recently, and he, he lost in the sixth round by a knockout. He also took on Ben Jones, and he won that fight via split decision on points. So, um, yeah, Jason Cunningham, quite a Biggish name, and obviously Jordan Gill in his proper first test here. Jordan Gill under the tutelage of the master guru himself, Mr. Dave Caldwell. That's a 10 rounder there. And the main event here, Lewis Ritson, 13 and 0, defending his British lightweight title for the very first time after taking it away from Robbie Barrett. I quite like the look of Lewis Ritson, to be honest. I know that his manager or his main sponsor or something had like a really um, small wager bet that he would go undefeated all the way up to winning the British title. And he cashed out for something like 200 and something thousand pounds. So unbelievable stuff there. Because it got to the actual fight night and he wasn't too confident. So if he if he was to win the fight, Lewis Ritson, he'd have won like double the money. But he decided to... He wasn't too sure if Lewis Ritson was going to beat Robbie Barrett, so he decided to cash out. But he still got over 200 grand, so credit to, to Lewis Ritson's manager. I don't think he wanted to tell him that until after the fight had been completed, but he was kicking himself afterwards because Lewis Ritson won the fight pretty easy. But yeah, he's a fighter that I'm looking forward to seeing what he's all about. 13-0 and 0 there, Lewis Ritson takes on Joe Murray, 23-2. and 2. Joe Murray, very, very tough fighter, certainly will come to fight, and that's quite a hard first defense, to be completely honest. So credit to Lewis Ritson for taking it. But that really wraps up the previewing. We've done the news, we did the reviewing, we brought you the first guest. The last thing to do, of course, before we wrap up part two, is to welcome our second and final guest. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the outright British welterweight champion, Mr. Bradley Skeet. Bradley, welcome to the show, mate. How do you enjoy? You good, man? Yes, my man. All good, all good. How are you? 
Yeah, buzzing now. Got, got the news I've been waiting for, so all good, I'm buzzing. <laughs> excellent, man, excellent. So obviously, Bradley, we last spoke back in July. It was the week of the Day 11's fight. I was there ringside for the fight. You put on another boxing clinic. I've been waiting to get you back on the show since then, but unfortunately, as you know, you've had a few misfortunes. It took this long to actually nail down a fight. Firstly, though, before we get on to that fight, uh, did you want to say a couple words on the on the Dow Evans win? Yeah, um, it, it was a good 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 win. Obviously, I won my British title outright. Something I set out to do for for like it was a boyhood dream of mine, and uh, yeah, I finally got it done. Um, the performance, I, I wouldn't say it was one of my best ones, but Dow Evans a strong fighter, come forward, aggressive fighter. Um, he uh, yeah, he gave me a good good fight, and uh, yeah, I won it. I won it comfortably, really. I didn't really. Didn't really engage, didn't really engage too much. Just won it, won it on my jab, really. And um, yeah, pleased, pleased to get the win, pleased to get my belt out right, and yeah, ready to move on now. And obviously, as we say there, you won the British title outright. Are you still the reigning champion, or did you have to vacate at all? No, still the champ, man. Still the champ. <laughs> Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. So obviously you did have one fight set up for February 10th, but the opponent pulled out. How frustrating was that, Bradley? Because I know that you were quite annoyed that you didn't get that shot that Corcoran got against Jeff Horn. And then obviously it was kind of like a keep busy fight, but then even that fell through. It was like an extra kick in the nuts kind of thing. Yeah, the the whole situation has been frustrating to say like I've I've, I've not boxed since July. Um, obviously there was talk of the Jeff Hall fight. I, I agreed all terms. It looked like we were set to fight. I was just waiting on a contract then for him to to look elsewhere and then go ahead and fight Gary Corker and that 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 was a, that was hard to take sort of thing. Um, but he's boxing. Um, got over it. Then obviously Frank had a big show in December. I didn't get put on that show. That was frustrating. Um, then, then obviously the, the the show in February um, was was looking at getting a good, meaningful fight, a world ranked fighter. Then, Laszlo Toff, no disrespect, wasn't the fight I was I was I wanted, but it, it was a fight. It was going to get me out, and then that fell through, and that show got cancelled. So it's just been frustrating, just so frustrating. Um, yeah, I just I've been in the gym, I've been training. I just been. I, I, I want a meaningful fight. I want to. That's all I want. I want to mix that world level. I want a meaningful fight. And now, um, yeah, now I did that. That fell through in, in February. But now I've been. I've been put forward to fight for the European vacant European title against against a good good fighter. So I'm beaten fighter. So yeah, man, I just grab grab it. Gonna grab it with both hands and and crack on. Yeah, absolutely. So as we say there, you were supposed to be fighting at the Copper Box on February 10th. You will now be fighting in Spain on March 24th in Bilbao for, as you said there, the EBU European title that's vacant at the moment. How did this opportunity come about, Bradley? And and was it a fight that you actually wanted or was it kind of one of those fights that was just there? Do you know what? After after be, becoming British champion, the, the the natural route to go is European level and then move on to world level. But no disrespect, domestic level, I, I stuck around a bit longer than what I should have. But it was my own selfish reasons. I wanted to win that belt outright. I'd done it. Um, I. To be honest, I see myself beyond European level because I, I go back to, to Sam Egger and having the European title and I beat him well. So I, I put myself beyond European level. So, but I went to I went to mix at world level and then and then mix and mix at that sort of high level and then get a good meaningful fights at that level. Then hopefully challenge for a world title. But I'm in I'm in a difficult uh, division. The 147 division is, is packed with elite level world champions. So I know I'm not going to get a look in anytime soon. So for me to, to, to fight at European level now and get get this European title and then and then and then move on to world world level, then it, it's perfect for me at this moment of time because at the minute I ain't getting the fights. I ain't getting the fights. So I think this will be perfect for me. He's a good fighter. He's unbeaten. Um, he's strong, so why not? I just thought, you know what? Let's let's go and do this. He was set to fight a French guy, but the French guy pulled out of the fight. And then I got the call and said, you want to fight for the European title? He's in Spain. I said, yeah, let's go. Book the flight. Let's do it. And obviously this guy, um, before I try and pronounce his name, Brad, do you want to have a crack before me? 
I just call him by his first name, Kerman. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this guy's name is Kerman Laharaga. That's how I think it may be said. Uh, yeah. Um, he's he's That's an un. Sick. Oh, mate, the roll of the tongue and everything. Hey, there you go, mate. You know me. Versatile. And, um, yeah, he's, he's obviously an unbeaten Spanish fighter. He's 24-0 and with 19 knockouts. He's world-ranked with a WBA and WBC. Do you know much more yeah. about him, Bradley? Because, to be honest, I haven't seen anything of him on video at all. Not really. I've seen a couple. There's a couple on YouTube. Um, I, I just know he's strong, he's tough, um, he's game. But to be honest, looking through his record, he hasn't really been in with anyone decent. Um, he's not really boxed out of Spain, from what I know. Um, and and yeah, I, I, he, he's, gonna, he's young, he's game. He's gonna be, he's gonna be hungry. He, he's not, he's not, he's not well ranked for no reason. He obviously has got good ranking, so it, it's a fight I need. It's a fight that's, that's gonna. Wet my appetite. It's a fight I'm going to get up for. It's in his backyard. Um, he's unbeaten, so he's, he's got he's got he's got the, the the mix there to probably be a good fight. Is that a little bit of a worry, Brad, going and travelling to Spain? I don't think it's got the best reputation for you know having the best scorecards at sometimes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but is this have you boxed the brawl before? I can't remember. I shouldn't. I should have checked before I, before I got you on. Not as a pro, no. It's my first. It's my first time abroad. But do you know what? It's, it's it's a boxing ring at the end of the day, and I thrive on it. I went up to Birmingham to beat Sam Egerton in his backyard to win the belt. Um, I, I, I thrive on it. I, it's it's going to be hostile. It's going to be it's, the crowd's not going to be on my side. But do you know what? I, I love it. I, that's that's what I want. I want to I want I want to go there and I want to shut them up. I want to bring that belt home, and it's it's just going to deter make me more determined to go out there and do a good job on it. And I don't believe that you've got any common opponents with this guy but one thing I do want to point out is this this guy that you're going to be fighting here Kerman um, I know that he fought Denton Vassell he knocked out Denton Vassell in the fourth round which was quicker than Frankie Gavin and Sam Eggington could do it that's just one fact I want to throw out for the listeners that may not know um, one other thing yeah. Bradley will it be shown on Box Nation this fight at all? Uh, I'm not too sure, to be honest. Not, I, I've not heard anything yet, but I don't see why not. I don't see see why not. I think, it, it, yeah, even if it gets recorded and shown at a later date or, or if it gets recorded live, um, I'm, I'm not too sure yet, but hopefully, yeah. Yeah, hopefully. I know it clashes, though, with the uh, the the Dillian White and Lucas Brown card at the O2 that Eddie Hearn's got on, so I know that they're, you know, both going up at the same time is obviously quite a risky yeah. thing. But um yeah, do you know do you know yet when you'll be flying out to Spain at all, Brad? Will it be the week of the fight before that at all? So uh I'll be over there next week for a couple of days and then I'll be over there on the start of fight week, I guess. Um, okay. and yeah, be there for the week and then yeah, get the fight done and then bring that belt home. Excellent, my man. Excellent. Right, coming down to the last couple of questions. I know for a fact you must have been watching Groves and Eubank on the weekend. What did you make of the fight, Brad? And who did you think would win going into the fight? Yeah, it was a great fight. It was a good fight. Um, I picked George Groves to win the fight. Um, yeah, I, I said it from the start that he'd win. You just got to look at the experience George Groves has got. He's been at elite level for a long, long time. He's done it the hard way. Um, he's had his upsets in the past, and I just I just couldn't see what Eubank was going to do. That's what was going to trouble Gross, to be honest. He was the bigger man. He, he, uh, he everything was going in Gross's favour, to be honest. Um, I just I couldn't see past him him not winning, and and he obviously put put on a, a good performance, and it and it proved it. I think Eubank didn't have a plan B. He he was just done the same thing from round one to twelve, really. And, uh, yeah, it just wasn't good enough to beat George Groves. And Horn versus Crawford, three weeks after your fight. Does Horn have any kind of chance in that one at all, Brad, for you? Not not, not, not a chance. Not a chance. Listen, he's a tough his game. He's done what he's done. But I think his time's up now, definitely. His time's up. Crawford's going to take that belt. And he's going he's gonna to be... be Hard to beat at, at 147. He, he cleaned up at 140, but at 147, it's, it's going to be hard to beat. 
And I want to ask you this also, Bradley. If Horn does lose to Crawford on April 14th, like we all think he will, that will mean that Crawford will have the WBO, Errol Spence will have the IBF, Keith Furman will have the WBC and WBA super belts there. Um, who would you say is the weakest champion out of those three there? Because they're all brilliant, brilliant fighters. Yeah. They're all elite. They're all elite level yeah. champions. Um, so, but it sounds a bit disrespectful to say the weakest one, but the, I'd say it would be Furman, where I, he's been inactive for so long um, with his injury. So looking looking at them three, I'd say you've got you've got to put you've got to put Spence at the top of the pile. To be honest, he's proven he's proven at one four seven. Um, Crawford, he's he's one four he's one forty, but he hasn't yet boxed at one four seven. So we we'll see how he deals with deals with um, with Paul, which I'm sure he will. And then, um, but Furman, yeah, I'd say he's the weaker one because obviously he's been out inactive. He's, he's not really boxed for a couple of years, um, uh, about a year. So yeah, I, I'd say he's the weakest one to be honest. I know that we've got the uh, the regular WBA champ newly crowned is Lucas Matisse as well. Yeah. I suppose he's in there probably, uh, you know. I mean, if, that's if, a fight I'd look at. Say that again? Definitely. That's a fight I'd look at, definitely. I'd, I'd, I'd like that fight, the Matisse fight. I'd love that fight. I mean, obviously, we saw he didn't really have it all his own, all his own way until he got the knockout of that guy he fought yeah. for the vacant belt, you know? So that would be a brilliant fight for you. Yeah, definitely. I think my style will gel with his. He's, he's, he's a strong, and again, strong puncher. He, he, he's got that knockout power, but I just think my style will be all wrong for him. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to see that fight. I really would. Jesus Christ, it's getting me excited just <laughs> thinking about it, Brad. Just before I let you go, Brad, anything that you want to tell our listeners at all? Yeah, no, just thanks for the support. It's been frustrating. It's been frustrating not not getting that out and being active. But, yeah, hopefully go go over to Spain, get this European title, bring it home, and then get some good dis- defences and, and then crack on, then crack on and get that world title fan. Absolutely, my man, absolutely. All right, listen, Bradley, it's always a pleasure, mate. You know that. Best of luck for March 24th, and we'll catch up sometime after, I'm sure. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate that, bro. Okay, and this wraps up episode 123 of the Box Hard Podcast. I've been your host, Joey Kosterman. I as Sumra has been I as Sumra. A big thank you to our two guests on this week's show, the former WBC lightweight world champion, Mr. Omar Figueroa, and the current outright British, soon-to-be EBU European champion, Mr. Bradley Skeet. The Prediction League currently stands at 25 points for you, the listeners, 23 points for Ayaz, and I'm way at the back with just 17 points. Thank you once again for listening. Enjoy your weekends, people, and we will see you next week.